uh, for our visitors. We've been working through Genesis slowly um, and uh, we've been dealing in the last, I think, four times with the question of the length of days in Genesis. So we're returning to that to hopefully finish that today. You might remember that when we fast first began considering this important topic, the length of days uh, in creation account, I called your attention to God's activity in verses 3 to 5, and specifically to where God said, let there be light, and there was light, and then God saw that the light was good, and then God separated the light from the darkness. And I said those verbs used of God express not only his activity, but they also taught fundamental truths about God himself. And so that when God said, let there be light, and there was light, it teaches his almighty power to create through the spoken word. And that omnipotence produced what omniscience had determined. And we said that those recurring words, and God said, followed by, and there was, or words equivalent to that, were what's known as fiat and fulfilment. And that they occur on each creative day, with only slight variation in days five and six. Then when we, when, when we said about, uh, spoke about when God saw that it was good, that what he created was good, we said that whilst the word good there no doubt expresses an aesthetically pleasing quality about God's work, that good also importantly meant that the standard of God's work was good according to the standard of God himself, that his pronouncement points back to his own good and perfect being, and that creation was measured by that. And so in God separating the light from the darkness, we said uh, that's, that's in effect what God caused when the earth first rotated uh, before the newly created light source and which produced the first complete day. And so that's why we read from that point on, at the close of each creative day's work, that repeated formula, and there was evening and there was morning, the such and such day. And so that step-by-step -step process by which creation was brought forth teaches us of the God of order. So in this first chapter we see three repetitive phrases over six creative days. God said, God said that, it, God uh, said, uh, created, he said, and it was so. God said that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the first day, or the second day or the third day. And whenever the scripture repeats itself, it always does so because it's something important for it that it wants us to learn from it. It's a bit like the lecturer underlining his study notes in red to make a point. And what those repetitions in Genesis 1 fundamentally highlight, and which we are to get, is that God created. That what God created was good and that his creative work was completed in six orderly days. Stand back from the details of creation account. Forget length of days, and the separating of waters from waters, and species and kind, and all those important but distracting details. Stand back from them for a moment. And the most important points Genesis wants us to see is that from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2 and verse 1 are these three fundamental points. God created. What God created was good, and that he created that over a six orderly days. 
And so when we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, we're meant to understand that almighty God, omnipotent God, omniscient God, omnipresent God, eternal self-existent God, transcendent and imminent personal God, the God who is good, and even the complex Trinitarian God created the heavens and the earth. So in other words, God's not a God amongst gods, or a power amongst powers, or a force amongst forces. No, he's the one eternal God from whom everything owes its existence. And so he's God, therefore, distinct from everything else. And as we've said, that's what Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 bellows at us. It says that there's God and then there's everything else. And likewise, as we stand back to look at these three repetitive phrases, we're meant to see the good God, whose works are a reflection of his own goodness. That as God is, so God acts. And that his work of creation is not only good, as we've said, in a sense of being wonderfully, aesthetically pleasing, but most importantly, his work of good is, is describing the, an objective good. So that it was like God, it was without fault, without blemish, without stain, without sin, without death. Because if God's work of creation contained any of those imperfections, it would contradict the axiom, as God is, so God acts. And so the pronouncement of good on God's, on, on, by God on his work is meant for us to see this. That God is good, and so creation was also good, as perfect as God. And so the third repetitive phrase of chapter 1, that there was evening and there was morning, the such and such day, speaks of an ordered six-day creative work which God used to complete and to provide a home for man to live in. That almighty God created his good creation in six orderly days. And so that brings us back to the topic of creation's days again. In the last, uh, in, in, in this, the last of the three recurring phra uh, phrases which indicate this particular fundamental point of importance. Now if I were to take these creation days as literal 24-hour days as I'm proposing, then what we're simply doing is taking God at his word. And we're simply agreeing with what we've just been saying about the first fundamental recurring point in this chapter. And that is that God, who spoke creation into existence, is indeed God in all of those attributes. And that we believe God is everything that he has revealed himself to be in and through the word. It doesn't mean that we understand how God created. It doesn't mean that we understand or comprehend the being himself of God. But it does mean that we take God at his word and in his word. I just read this week from a commentary by a respected theologian where he says that he favours the non-literal approach of creation, primarily because of what present science has to say. Well, well, we'll give him that even if we entirely disagree with him. But then he goes on also to say something else. And get this, he says, he, he rejects creation also because, he says, it is difficult to imagine that Adam named all the animals, both domestic and wild, underwent an operation, woke up, and composed a poem, all within the daylight hours of the sixth day. 
Now, quite apart from some unwarranted assumptions about naming the animals, what this writer, because of his scientific bias, is really saying is that the God who created somehow isn't at all almighty God. Because in his mind, God isn't able to accomplish what transpired in that sixth day. And as I understand them, it's because God isn't big enough to do that. But such an objection is seriously flawed reasoning. Because if God did breathe into existence the stuff of the universe, in fact, if God spoke anything at all from nothing to something, that, that would make the events of day far simply a non-issue by comparison. Mm. That is unless your reason science is bigger than your God. And, and the same applies to those ob other objections with regard to the hows of creation. How is it possible for a universe to be created in one day? How is it possible for the earth to be formed and filled in six days? How did God accomplish what transpired through Adam on the sixth day? And these are all quite frankly non-issues if God is almighty. And so the whole issue comes back to how big is your God? And to me it's the same, it's the same issue with regard to the inerrancy of the scriptures and the authority of the Bible. And when people ask such questions as how can we trust an ancient book like this Bible? Or how is God able to speak without error through fallible men? Or how do we know if we have accurate source material? Or how, do we, how could these writings be transmitted uh, in, uh, accurately over the centuries? And who or what determines why we have 66 books that make up the canon of Scripture? And my answer is that whilst there is tremendously substantial reason to say that what we have in the Bible today is the true Word of God, I always respond, even before that, with the question, well, how big is your God? Is he able to create? Is he able to work miracles? Is he able to defeat death and to rise from the grave? And if he did those things, then don't you think he can inspire and keep his own word from error? So how big is your God? And so the question of a six-day literal creation, a third fundamental point of Genesis 1, is a non-issue if the first fundamental point, God is God, is true. But I suppose another question might be raised about the creation week being six literal days in length. That is, why? Why six days? Why not one day, or a hundred days, or a thousand days? Why six plus one day? And that's, a, that's an interesting question, because we know from various extant sources that the six plus one day week cycle was attested to by, by other ancient Near Eastern civilizations which predated Moses. And so whilst... That's answerable because the ancients certainly did have a great interest in solar and lunar and generally astronomical movements, and so they may have derived their seven-day week from their observations. It's probably more reasonable to suggest that oral tradition passed down from Adam and which was transmitted and generated from one generation to another ever since, is why the, in earlier times non-Hebrew people adopted the seven-day week cycle. But whatever the case, clearly the six plus one day week cycle is God's prescription for his people at very least. Although I would strongly argue that he intended it for all men. And so, of course, the first, firstly, we see that cycle worked out in Genesis 1, as we've been studying. 
But also notice in chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3, it goes on to reiterate this. Chapter 2 and verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Verse 2. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And then verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creation that he had done. And whilst Genesis 1 and 2 don't explicitly say anything about this six plus one day cycle being something God had instructed Adam and Eve to observe, it would be highly conceivable that Adam and Eve did comply with it. Given that later it does become God's explicit command for his people. And if Adam did comply, then their children would have followed also. And no doubt, over time, and through generation after generation, and the dispersion of the tribes, the six plus one day cycle formed the pattern for all people from the very beginning. But irrespective of that, By the time we get to the book of Exodus, we have the specific command of God about this. And so we read in Exodus 20 and verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the Sabbath is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Then following the reason why that should be. Verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And then again in Exodus 31, verse 17, speaking again of the Sabbath, we read, It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. I notice a couple of things about that injunction in these verses. Firstly, remember that this is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And the injunction is for God's people to keep a Sabbath day of rest on the seventh day of the week. Six days were they to work, and one day were they to cease from working. But then, secondly, notice that the seventh day of rest instituted by God is based on His resting on the seventh day, having completed the work of creation in six days. And so the injunction for the Hebrews' literal weekly Sabbath day rest can only make sense, given the way it's put to them, is if God's creative week was also a six literal creative day day week, followed by one day of rest. And it would be an illogical conclusion to emphasize a literal seventh day of the week on the basis of this paradigm if it was a non-literal seven day or six days in creation, or that creation was non-literal and indefinite in length, or days were varied in length, and then to project those indefinites into a definite framework, it would be illogical. And so for the Hebrews, the most natural reading of Exodus 20 would be to understand the literal reading of the six plus one days in creation week used as the basis for their own six six plus one day working week so that God created, if you like, in six normal days as they would have understood days to mean. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, could you Could you imagine a Hebrew child asking her father, Daddy, why does everyone stop working one day a week? And her father answering, Well, you see, darling, even though God created over eons of time, those eons represented extended six days. There aren't literal days like our days. You know, just like the pictures in the box story I told you about, or the clothes pegs on the washing line that we talked about before. No, no, that 
That wouldn't make any sense to a grown-up. Never mind a little child. And the father's answer to his child would simply be, darling, because that's what God did. After he created everything in six days, he rested. That's what he's told us to do. That's the simple reading of it. So we can answer the question, why six days to create? By saying, because in this orderly universe which God created, the earth was designed to orbit the greater light once a year. And the lesser light was meant to orbit the earth once a month. And he also designed all sorts of staggeringly scientific reasons that the earth would rotate on its axis before the greater light once every 24 hours. And that all of those movements together would produce our seasons and our climate and our tidal and our gravitational and our magnetic systems. And so in creating six 24 hours days as he did, then ceasing his work on the seventh day, he laid down the good pattern which reflected his wisdom and his goodness and where mankind would most richly be blessed in following it. And I couldn't help but think as I was preparing this that if the church in our day hadn't traded up off so much the sanctity of our day of rest, then maybe it mightn't have so quickly traded off a literal interpretation of Genesis 1 as well, given their close connection with regard to reverence to God. But now, uh, to, to, in our closing point, notice some important points of general exegesis from Genesis 1. Firstly, the word day, as it's found in Genesis 1, it may surprise you to hear, is virtually without exception agreed that it should most naturally be read literally. Across the views, all agree that the most natural reading for day is to read it literally. And so to the Hebrew reading it, his natural framework of interpretation would have been according to his own 24-hour day. And in fact, it's been often stated that the onus for providing proof to show that the days in creation week are anything but literal days lies very much on the shoulders of those who reject that position. And that's because the literal reading of the days of Genesis 1 is the natural reading. But the reason the natural reason is being rejected, as again is mostly fully agreed, is in order to accommodate the theory of evolutionary science. So the non-literal readings are in fact, when you look at it, special pleading on the subject. In other words, from a biblical perspective... It isn't the literalist that should be under scrutiny and made to feel as if he must prove his view. It's the exact opposite. It's the non-literalist who should be under scrutiny and must provide us with better answers than they've been giving if they want their view to stand. But then from a general second point of exegesis, the recurring and there was evening, and there was morning, only makes sense if it has purpose. And it can only make sense if it's understood in the context of a normal, literal 24-hour day. After all, what could it mean if days are millions of years in length? Is it saying that in the course of a day's millions of years, that the period began with, say, tens of thousands of years of dimness, followed by hundreds of thousands or so years of bright light, followed by another tens of thousands of years of dimness again, before another million or so years of night, only to repeat the cycle all over again. 
Because if that's what it means, it makes no sense when you're talking about millions of years of time. And the referring phrase would have no purpose at all. And so why have it here? And why repeat it as if it's something important? But if a day means a literal day, then to mention that there was evening and there was morning separating each day is completely natural. More than that, it would seem that, that the refrain is deliberately included to emphasize a normal, natural, literal 24-hour days and to guard against any other interpretation that would challenge it. And then a third general exegetical observation. From a close reading of the text, you'll see that there are some deliberate insertions and omissions in the phrase, and there was evening and there was morning, the first, the, the such and such day, and which unfortunately our translations in general fail in bringing out. And if, if we were to literally translate this phrase from the original text as it occurs across the first chapter, it would read something like this. Genesis 1, verse 5, and there was evening and there was morning, day 1. Yeah, that's, that's literally how it's stated. Mm. It's using uh, the, the cardinal. Mm. And it's specifically put that way. But then in, in verse 8, there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Mm. Not day 2, but a second day. And the same goes for the others. There was evening and morning, a third day and a fourth day. In verse 23, and there was evening and there was morning a fifth day, but, verse 31, and there was evening and there was morning a day the sixth. That's how it's put. And then chapter 2 and verse 2, and on the seventh day God finished all the work which he had made, and he rested on a day the seventh. So on close inspection you can see the omission of the definite article on days 2 to 5, and where we translate a day, a second day, a third day, a fourth day. But then we see the inclusion of the definite article on the ordinal numbers, sixth and seventh days, but not on the word day itself. That's still anathras. And so we would translate these verses, there was evening and morning, a day the sixth. There was evening and morning, a day the seventh. But then to make it just a little bit more difficult, on day one we see the substituting of the definite article and in its place the deliberate use of a cardinal number translated as day one. And so a literal translation of verse five, as we said, would be, and there was evening and there was morning, day one, as opposed to the others. So why are there these deliberate omissions and insertions? And why is the cardinal day one used on the first day? And the answer, I think, is because the writer was being descriptive. Not only of the order of the days, but also regarding the length of the days. And that's because God, having created the life source, then describing daytime, followed by separating day and night as the earth rotated. What the author was careful to do was to qualify the first day, period, as a day's length. And not merely as the first day of many other days. Because the earth now having for the first time rotated once on its axis, and as it stated where there was now evening and morning, he's saying, that's day one, complete. That's what it is. And we know what it is from what we know a day is, it's 24 hours. And so having emphasized what a day is using a cardinal day one, he doesn't use the cardinal again, saying day two, day three, and so on, but names them as we expect them to, using ordinals, the second day, the third day, the fourth day. 
So day one is emphasized as being a descriptive of a normal day. That there was evening and there was morning, day one. Here's the standard, here's the picture for what's going to come next. And so if that answers why the first day is actually written day one, then why did he emphasize day six and seven by using the definite article? Verse 30, 31, and there was evening and there was morning a day, the sixth. Chapter 2 and verse 2, and he rested on a day, the seventh. And what he means here is something like this, a day, the sixth one, or a day, the seventh one. And it seems he does that firstly, to continue his emphasis that these days are all the same day units as day one was. That together with day one, they are completing the, the, in completing the evening-morning cycle, they are complete 24-hour cycles that make up a day. But that they, these six, so verse, uh, day six and seven are also special days in creation week. Day six because that was the day that man was created. And day seven because that's the way when God rested and bless the day. In other words, he's concluding by saying something out like this. Having created man, verse 31, there was morning and evening a day, the sixth one, the last one, the last day of creation, the one when man was created. That's the emphasis of the article there. And likewise, the seventh day is like every other day in terms of length, but it's specifically marked out as the seventh one, the one that God rested on and ceased from work. And so as we look closely at how this third fundamental and repetitive phrase is deliberately rewritten, again the evidence points to a unit of creation orderly constructed and which reveals a God of order. A God who so designed it and accomplished it literally in six 24-hour days and who set the pattern to integrate uh, sublimely with the rest of his workings in the cosmos and for the ultimate good of man. Well, there we'll leave it, I, I think. We'll leave it on the note that in spite of what's being almost universally taught, that historically, as we've considered, and theologically and literally, the literal position not only holds its own, but it does so in a way which is consistent with the rest of the Bible's teaching. Therefore, it upholds the veracity of the Bible. And that whilst the present opposing views seek to blot out the position of literal interpretation, these alternative views really have a great deal to prove. And not least so when it comes to the contradictions it produces in the Bible and therefore the issue of the veracity of the Bible. So let's just leave it there, shall we? We'll come back to it in a couple of weeks' time, I think.